no specific effect of lesion, but we'll have the test. So I'm going to do, can I do graphesthesia on you and stereognosis on you? Sure. So I'm going to call you over and uh, I will ask you to demonstrate how to do stereognosis, or rather I'll ask you to show how to do stereognosis okay. and how to do graphesthesia. Okay? And uh, I think that will be the only one, stereognosis graphesthesia. Uh, there's nothing else we need to show. Okay. Okay. So good morning, MUA. Good morning. Good morning. So we are going to demonstrate the functional areas in the parietal lobe. Again, as usual, let's pick up where we had left off with describing the frontal lobe. Let's put a few sulcine gyra in place and then we'll put the functional areas. As I told you earlier, the entire portion of the brain, most of it, behind the central sulcus of Rolando is the parietal lobe. So let's put the first sulcus in place. As again, like the previous, we saw that there is a sulcus which is roughly parallel to the central sulcus. That is known as the post-central sulcus. Once we put the post-central sulcus in place, we have again a gyrus which is demarcated between the two. And that gyrus is known as the post-central gyrus, which contains the primary somatosensory cortex, Broadman area 3, 1, 2. This receives all the sensations from the entire body. If you were to look right at the bottom of this primary sensory cortex, there is yet one more area. This is called the secondary somatosensory cortex, or S2. If there is a lesion of the primary sensory cortex, let me before that, let me tell you the function of the primary sensory cortex. The primary sensory cortex is responsible for not only receiving all the primary sensations, but it's also responsible for appreciating some of the higher integrative cortical sensations. And what are some examples of integrative cortical sensations? One of them is graphesthesia, the other is stereognosis. May I ask Gizem to come over here and demonstrate to us how to do the test for stereognosis. She's going to pick up an object with her eyes closed and she'll be able to describe it. So, please pick up an object with your eyes closed and tell us what this is. Pencil. So, this is stereognosis. The ability to move an object in your hand without seeing it. It's important that you first move the object in your hand and then be able to describe it. I'm going to use, I'm going to do another test on her, which is also testing of the same area. And that is, I'm going to keep your eyes closed. I'm going to write something on your palm. And I'll ask her to identify what I've written. What did I write? Let me do it again. The letter A. OK. So that is graphesthesia. Thank you very much, Kisan. So this area, these are the integrative or the cortical sensations which we, which are perceived by the primary sensory cortex, somatosensory cortex. So if there's a lesion of this area, the person has got contralateral A graphesthesia, contralateral A stereognosis, opposite side. What about the lesion S2? Here we get a unique situation. If there's a lesion of the area S2, the person has got what is known as pseudothalamic pain syndrome, dissociation between pain and its meaning. So these are the primary and the secondary sensory, somatosensory areas. Let's continue with the other areas of the parietal lobe. Let's put another sulcus in place. We can see that the sulcus runs right through the remaining part of the parietal lobe. This sulcus is known as the intraparietal sulcus. Once we put the intraparietal sulcus in place, again we can see that the rest of the parietal lobe gets divided into an upper and lower part. The upper part is known as the superior parietal lobule, SPL, and the lower part is known as the inferior parietal lobule, IPL. Let's take them one by one. The superior parietal lobule has got two areas, five and seven. What function does this perform? This is a higher order of sensory than the S1 and S2. This is again responsible for stereognosis, statognosis, and somatognosis, body image. So therefore, if there's a lesion of this area, the person has got again a stereognosis, a statognosis, a somatognosis, and also the patient will have bilateral apraxia. So this is the 
superior brain. This area functionally is referred to as the somesthetic association area. It is a higher order than S1 and S2. Let's come to the remaining part, the inferior parietal lobule. We have demarcated one important area in the dominant side. There's a gyrus which is at the end of this sulcus here. This gyrus, which we have labeled as 39, is a very important gyrus which is seen only on the dominant side, and this is known as the angular gyrus. It is also referred to as Einstein's area because it performs the higher order of mathematical calculations, finger recognition, and not only that, we will see in our subsequent slides that this area is also part of other functional areas like verticals, visual association area, occipital eye field, and so on and so forth. So therefore, this area is very important on the dominant side, and therefore, this area has been called the Einstein's area. If there's a lesion of this Einstein area, angular gyrus, on the dominant side, we get a unique situation called Gerstmann syndrome, where the person, the person has got inability to perform calculations, a calculia, cannot write a graphia, cannot recognize his right fingers, because this is on the left side. That is called finger agnosia. He has got right left disorientation. And so these are the features of Kirschman syndrome, which is seen only of lesion of angular gyrus. Let's put one more place, gyrus in place on the dominant side in the inferior parietal lobe. That is known as the supramarginal gyrus, area 40. This is again seen on the dominant side. And this lesion of this area produces conduction aphasia because it contains the superior longitudinal fasciculus running inside it. Apart from this, lesion of this area will also produce orofacial apraxia. That's also an important manifestation. In general, if there's a lesion of the inferior parietal lobule on the dominant side, apart from all these manifestations, the other manifestations will be ideomotor apraxia, ideational apraxia. These are all various types of apraxia which are seen lesions of the dominant side. However, what is not shown in this picture, but the same inferior parietal lobule is present on the non-dominant side also, which you cannot see here, but it's on the other side. That has got a totally different set of functions. And it does not have the separate angular gyrus or supramarginal gyrus, but it is considered as the IPL as a whole. And that IPL as a whole is called the multimodal association cortex. <laughs> what does that mean? It is concerned with body image. And if that area is destroyed on the non-dominant side, it is called syndrome of non-dominant IPL. And the two cardinal manifestations of syndrome of non-dominant IPL are, one, person has got construction apraxia. Cannot make a simple diagram, or cannot construct a simple object. And the person also has got sensory hemineglect of the opposite side. So since the lesion is on the non-dominant side, that's the right side, the person tends to neglect not only the left side of his body, but every sensation on the left side of the world. That is called left sensory hemineglect. That happens only on the non-dominant side. So we have seen the functional areas on the lateral surface of the brain, the parietal lobe. What about the medial surface? So again, let's come back to the picture of the medial surface, which we had left off. Let's put a functional area on the medial surface, and that is this area. This whole area is precuneus. This precuneus is nothing but the continuation of the superior parietal lobule, which we saw on the lateral surface. That's why the color coding is the same, and the functional area is also the same, if you notice here. The precuneus on the medial side is the continuation of the superior parietal lobule, and it's got the same function. The only thing is the precuneus is on the medial side. So that finishes with the parietal lobe. 